The studies show that people take on average about a year to decide that they're going to buy or sell a house. And during that time frame, they pick their agent in one day. And they spend a year thinking about this decision and they pick the agent that's gonna handle it in one day. And it's almost always the last one that they talk to or the one they talk to the most. So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Hey, Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui, and I'm interrupting myself to bring you this commercial break from one of our sponsors. There's somebody I've been looking at for a long time, and when they reached out to me, I said, yes, we have to be able to do this deal. So that sponsor is Follow Up Boss. There's a lot of superstars out there that use Follow Up Boss. What's your favorite CRM? We're using Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. I love Follow Up Boss. I love it. We have action plans now for bringing on new agents. We have action plans for our recruiting. Uh, we call them action plans and follow-up boss, which will trigger tasks for the agents to do as far as calling. Follow-up boss, I like more for the integrations with everything, MailChimp, call action, all those different products. I will say we used Sync and we switched from Sync to follow-up boss. Honestly, the greatest CRM I've ever used, I've used Rivity Sync. I've looked at Boomtown, like Real Geeks, just a bunch of different ones, but me personally, I fell in love with Fub about like seven months ago when I first started using it. I've used Boomtown, I've used Line Desk, I've used Conversion, and I think follow-up boss gives you the most integrations mm -hmm. that are simple, and it gives you the best ability to go and integrate large things into one single solitary platform yet at the same time, it's still affordable. I do like Follow Up Boss better just because it you can text from the app and things like that. It's just a little more convenient for me. Um, it tracks everything that I need. I can customize it if I want. If I want to go smart list based, that's fine. If I want to go task based, it's fine. I think it's one of the best systems and it's very user friendly. It just really helps me never drop a ball because it, it's so user friendly. I don't have a one horse in the race with Follow Up Boss, purely objective. Follow Up Boss has been the best one that we've found. Now I've used Follow Up Boss. We've actually used it in our non-real estate businesses as well because it's so good at being able to set timers, set automatic texting and emailing. So here's what we got. For Real Estate Rockstars listeners, you get a 30 day free trial. That's normally 14 days. So in order to get this, you go followupboss.com, just like it sounds, forward slash rockstars. Go there, get your 30 day free trial and check it out especially if you aren't using any systems or any CRMs yet, this will be a great one for you to start with. Thanks again, now back to our show. Recording in progress, Real Estate Rockstars. This is Aaron Muchistegi, and hey, I'm back. It's been a couple months since I got to interview somebody on here. I'm sure you guys have heard my voice in some of those intros and some of those ads and all the stuff that you guys are less excited about hearing. But today I get to talk to Caleb Spears, Caleb's part of the Spears Group uh, from 30A, uh, that whole area in Florida, 30A. It's like Destin. Uh, he'll be able to tell you more about it with a new, a new group with Compass out there. And I'm excited. I got to meet Caleb last month. We've actually talked several times since. And today we're going to go deep into real estate. Caleb, how's it going, man? It's going well. I can't complain. I live at the beach and it's, uh, it's June. So the sun is shining and uh, doesn't get much better. Dude, it was so funny. So um, you and um, and other members of, of the Spears group out there, you guys flew out to our mastermind out here in May. You brought you know five or six team members with you. And it was funny, you had mentioned Destin and I started, uh, even when I was on stage, I kind of mentioned like, oh, I went out there two different trips last month. It was fantastic. And we went to sit, sit down. You guys are like, what? That's where we live. That's where, that's where we are. Like the, uh, I can't believe you came out there last month. And you do live in uh, in paradise right now. I mean, it's it's been a very popular area. Florida's gotten more popular the last two years, especially. I guess, or has it just has that area always been popular? Has thirty A always been popular? So, any any of your listeners from the southeast, especially the, the big hubs like Atlanta, Dallas, Nashville, Birmingham, they have known thirty A since the day they were born, probably. Probably um, this area has been very popular for a drive-in destination from all the major southeastern hubs. 
But over the last two years, when people could not fly out of country, they started looking for more local destinations in our area. It was already big and it's just grown exponentially in the last two years. Our beaches are sugar white sand. I mean, literally, I've had kids come down with with clients on trips and go, mommy, it snowed. It snowed overnight. And that's how white they are. The, the water's emerald green. I mean, it's it's fantastic. So people found this and went, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is in the US and I don't have to fly to the Bahamas to get here. So we've grown a lot over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people driving. Actually, yesterday, my 12-year-old daughter, her church is going, they call it beach camp. Last night at 9.30, I dropped them off at the bus and they're driving to um to the airport town the uh just like northwest where you're at what's that airport? niceville valparaiso the, vps um there's panama know. city panama city yes. so they're like they're driving to panama city and they're heading over to the, to the beach from there so it'll be her third time being out there in a couple months but her church is even going out there so yeah i think a lot of people see that as a destination that they can they can drive to or they can fly to without leaving. So very cool. So how long have you been in real estate? I have been in real estate. So I got my license when I was 18. I'm 25 now. So six years and change. All right. And the, have you lived out in, in that area ever since? Did, is that, is, did you grow up there or did you get transplanted out there? So almost everybody in our area is a transplant, but I am one of the few that that's a homegrown. My dad's a custom home builder uh-huh. and his parents were missionaries and my mom's parents were pastors and they lived north of here in a little town called Crestview. And they met in high school. My my dad's got a phenomenal business mind. And so he was working two jobs, going to college on the side, um, trying to become an engineer and a surveyor. He ended up founding his own company down here, um, further South, closer to the beach. And he's been He's a civil engineer, a surveyor, a general contractor, an architect and a draftsman. He has his real estate license. He laid sod as a kid. Like (laughs) if there's anything to do with a house, he's done it. So we grew up here in this housing market. We moved every two years because he would build something. We'd live in it two years for the tax break and then we'd move. And so we've, uh, we've kind of had real estate in our blood since day one. Yeah. Very cool. So now you, so you became, you said you became an agent right at 18. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was actually towards the end of 18. I was finishing up college at that time and I was working at Chick-fil-A of all places. I was a manager at the local one here and my brother saw me talking to some stranger. We were on vacation together and he said, Hey, I think you'd be good at real estate. Like you're talking to those people. It's, it's real casual. Why don't you come join my team? I was like, well, if you're serious, I'll, I'll quit my job and I'll do it. And so that's what I did. Two months later, I had a real estate license and I was at Sotheby's International Realty. I'm sure some of the listeners that were doing the math, you said, I was about to finish college. And you also said you were 18. So the, so back up for a second and and tell me how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So, so my brother, Jonathan is, um, one of the top agents in the country. He's got over a billion dollars in career sales at age 30. He's been on the podcast. So you're listening. Yeah. For listeners out there, I've interviewed Jonathan several times. He was one of the speakers that came, that came out and spoke to our event out in Austin and, and uh, always have fun getting to chat with him. So the, yeah. So go ahead. So he blazed a path where he started college at the age of 14. He went from middle school to college. (laughs) He skipped high school entirely. So in the state of Florida, you can do something called dual enrollment. And usually that doesn't start until your sophomore year of high school or, or after your sophomore year, rather. So your junior, senior year. And my brother was like, hey, if I test into it, could I just skip all that and go in my freshman year? And they were like, I guess. And so he ended up going to college at 14, graduated at 18. I saw that path and I was like, that's really smart because the county paid for our education during those years. So he actually got his four-year degree for free. And so I went to public high school freshman, sophomore year. I wanted to play on the sports teams and be involved in the social life aspect. And then after that sophomore year, I started going to college full-time. So when I graduated high school, I had my my two-year degree. I transferred to Florida State and I I basically just fast tracked it and tried to um, hustle as hard as I could to uh, to wrap up my four year degree. Because when I got my real estate license, 
my broker was like, Hey, I know you're in college. How long would it take you to finish? I said, I don't know, like two years. And he goes, would you put your name to it? (laughs) Uh, I guess. And he said, great. It's going to be in your contract. If two years from today, you're not finished with college, you're fired because you may not need your degree, but I, I want you to have that. I don't want real estate to take you off your path of finishing your degree. And so I was like, well, shoot, I want to work full time. So if I'm contractually obligated to finish, I'm just going to hustle. And um, I was working full time. I was taking like 25 hours of, of coursework each semester and just wrapped up um, right after my 19th birthday. Wow. So the, so your first two years, you went to high school and college at the same time, dual track. That's a special thing that Florida does. And maybe some other states do that. And then by the time you were a junior in high school, you were also a junior in college. Did you stop going to high school at that point? And you just went all the way and you just went to the college. So I, so Jonathan was a junior when he was a junior in high school. What I did was I was basically a freshman in college when I was a junior in high school. Oh, got it. Okay. That's, when, that's when you did the, the dual enrollment. And then when you finished, um, when you turned 18, you had two years of college left and your broker gave you that challenge. And he said, I will, I'll hire you, but only if you finish, that's really inter- That's a really interesting perspective and, and pretty cool that he did that. You know, it's a, we, we live in a world and in a time where um, not everybody goes to college. Some people go to college and they don't get what they pay for. Other people go to college and they get it. And, you know, some people are like, great. I, I had a great experience in college. The classes I took and the people that I met there really helped me in my career. I have also met a lot of people that it goes the other way. So being able to have that encouragement to finish, at least for later, right? It's, it happens a lot with athletes and stuff too. Like get the degree and finish because you just never know when something might change, like maybe you won't like real estate anymore. Um, Maybe you'll want to be doing something else or you never know. It's, it's a lot tougher to open doors after the fact. So if you keep those doors open along the way, it makes it a little easier. Yeah, he was adamant. He's so we had an amazing leadership group at Sotheby's who really cared about us beyond just our production and being agents. They were um, some of the best leaders I've had the pleasure of being around. And his thing was, look, you may, you may never need your degree. I mean, you're starting in real estate. This might end up being very successful for you, but you're never going to regret having it. And I don't want you to ever get into a position down the road, like you said, where this, this snowball of real estate, it starts rolling down the hill it builds and builds and builds. You're probably not going to go back to school and finish. So you might as well knock it out now. And that way, if you need it, you've got it. And I appreciated that. He, he really cared about me as a person enough to, to throw down the gauntlet on that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. If you take a break, it's going to be a lot harder to, to restart again. So you just kept going. So awesome. All right. So now you're 18. He hires you. Um, he says you still got to go to college. So you're working full time and you're being an agent. So you're taking 25 hours in classes. How did you get your first deals as an agent? What was it like your first year? Did you make any money your first year in real estate while you were also a student? Yeah. I mean, I was working hard, but even though my dad was a builder and I would help him a little bit when I was younger, I'd I'd clean up job sites and things like that. I really didn't have a great knowledge base. I was still just, you know, a teenager trying to figure life out and figure out how the house buying process even worked. So I, I really started with a very low knowledge base I laugh. I look in my phone. I've never changed it because it just makes me chuckle at how far I've come. The very first lender I ever talked to, I put her name in there and next to her name, I put financer because I was like, okay, they finance houses. That's probably what they're called. And I just didn't know. And so that first year, the learning curve was steep for me. It took me about five months to get my first sale. It was a $300,000 house an hour north of me in like the most undesirable part of our whole area. Um, But I learned a lot over that first year. I ended up closing three and a half million in sales volume. I think I made a whopping like 30 grand, um, which was, you know, I was 19. So I felt, I felt like I was king of the world with 30 grand, but Um, it's definitely one of those things where my, as my knowledge grew, my sales volume grew. And so that was the biggest thing for me was learning. Yeah. So the, so that very first deal that was like an hour away, took you six months to get a deal. What were you doing to try to, to find, were you on the buyer side? Were you on the sell side? The education, the advice I was given when I started was, Hey, eventually you want to be listing dominant and listing heavy. 
But before you can really make your mark on the listing side, you need to know what buyers are looking for. And you also need to learn the market. And when you just have one listing in one place, you know that little area. But when you're working with a bunch of buyers and you're running them around everywhere, you're figuring out the market, you're figuring out the questions to ask people, right? We've all been there where we showed someone like 15, 20 homes, they didn't buy it. We're exhausted, they're exhausted, and, and they just give up. And you, you learn as a buyer's agent, when you're new, you start to whittle that down. You start to learn the questions to ask so that instead of showing them 15 homes, you go, no, 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 10 of those are not going to work. Here's why. And you, you show them four houses and they buy one. You go, oh, that worked. And you grow. You grow as an agent. And then eventually, when you get that listing, you know what buyers are looking for. You know the questions they're going to have. You know the objections they're going to give you about that house. And you can list a home with a lot more confidence and a lot more success. So I was very buyer heavy in the beginning. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Kind of a great part of that story because because every, I think a lot of agents come. Everybody finds their niche, but I hear a lot of new new agents, especially saying it'd be so great to be a listing agent and be so great to be a listing agent. Essentially, because a lot of times the beginning as an agent, it's scary. You're an entrepreneur for the first time, and you're not guaranteed to make any money. There is no guarantee. Even when you get a client, there's no guarantee. It's like that right now for people. Like people are, you know, you could have been a buyer's agent for somebody for six months making offers every month and they might not have gotten one over the past year. So the, so people love being that listing agent, but I think it's great to, to tell people like you will become a better listing agent and get more listings if you're okay and you dive all in to becoming a buyer's agent at the beginning to really learn those markets and learn those things. What's your, what's your level of volume like right now? Like what volume did you do last year and how much of them were listings and how much, how many of them are on the buy side? So right now I'm about 75% of my business is listings. So mm -hmm. I have made that transition to mostly listings. I personally really enjoy the listing side. That's fun for me. I've got other people on my team that are amazing buyer's agents and it gives them hives to list. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and it really is, like you said, everyone has their niche, you know, buyers, you get to show them around. It's, it's a little more work intensive, time intensive, but everybody's having a good time. We're looking for houses. We're going to buy something. This is fun. Listings are like, Hey, I need you to sell my house yesterday. I'm i I'm running out of time. And there's some pressure there. I love that. I thrive in that, but everyone's got to find what works for them in terms of a volume. Last year, I think I did 36 and a half million in sales with an average sales price of about one and a half million. And I did that in 10 months because I took two months off when my son was born. He was a NICU baby. We had some complications. And so I just shut everything down for two months to be with my wife and my son and, and take care of them. Um, and then this year I've, I'm at 25 million so far on the year. Hey guys, this is Aaron Muchastegui for a quick commercial break. And here is a paid advertisement from a guy whose voice you might recognize. Do you want to invest in real estate without all the work? I mean, like incredible returns, massive tax savings, one of the best inflation hedges of all time without all those headaches that come with it. My name is Brandon Turner, a best-selling real estate author with over a million copies of my book sold. And this here is an ad. That's right, a crummy commercial, but I'm actually not selling anything. I'm offering something. You see, I run a real estate investment company we're called Open Door Capital, where we acquire what's called value add real estate nationwide to earn great returns for passive investors just like you. We've acquired hundreds of millions of dollars in mobile home parks and apartments, and we recently sold our first fund where we earned our investors over a 35% internal rate of return. And while our past performance is obviously no guarantee of future results, we do believe our track record speaks for itself. Best of all, we have an amazing deal right around the corner right now. So be sure to sign up for our email list at investwithodc.com to be notified when it's open for investment. That's investwithodc.com. I think that was another thing we probably had in common and touched on. My, my second daughter was the one that's in Florida now. She was the NICU baby. And that was the moment I remember standing over her when she was hooked up to the bubbler machine to help her breathe. And that was the moment I quit my job and said, I got to try to, I got to try to do something better than just barely make it and just barely mm -hmm. be okay. And uh, for the next two months, I, I thought that was like, I actually, I didn't make any money the first two months of starting that. And I was kind of wishing like, oh man, was that a right, the right decision or not? But yeah. So, well, you've had a, so you still had a big year, even taking the two months off and now you're 70% on the listing sides. You're, you're, you're part of a team. When you think back now to, you know, six, seven years ago, what's a piece of advice that you would give yourself 
that you, you know, you wish you had known when you first got started? I wish there's a couple of things. I wish I would have been more tenacious because I let the overwhelming amount of things I didn't know scare me into not being as bold as I should have been. And I've got a guy on our team now who came down here with, he came from Kansas city, which is not a reciprocal market to our area. So he knew nobody. He had no real estate experience. He had a little bit of sales experience on the medical sales side, but it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he ended up doing $25 million in sales in his first year, which was blowing our minds. We didn't think a a brand new agent was going to be capable of that. We kind of laughed a little bit when he told us his goal, he said, he said, I'm going to do 50 million. And we were like, bro, you're, you're shooting a little big there, but I mean, none of us thought even 25 was in the realm on the possibility. And he just knocked it out of the park because he was so unafraid of the phones. He would sit there for three or four hours every day, just cold calling, cold calling, cold calling. And when he would find someone willing to sell, he would start calling agents. He would start calling other people he had talked to and saying, Hey, I've got this deal. These are the specs. Do you want someone to buy it? And he actually, his niche is investors. He loves working the investment side. And what he realized was, Hey, investors are unemotional. If I can just bring them the right numbers, they're going to buy it. So he figured out where those numbers were best. And he just called every single person and ended up with $25 million in his first year. I wish I would have been as bold as him and not let the fear of the unknown or the fear of my own insecurities of, Oh, I'm not enough. I don't know enough. I wish I wouldn't have let that slow me down. I wish I would have been bolder. Um, The other thing I wish I would have done is taken more time to ask good questions to my clients because I did spend a long time running, you know, 15, 20 showings in a day. And like, I remember I showed a guy property till 1am one night and I was exhausted. And those buyers don't buy. I mean, you might convert like one out of 10 if you're good, but that is not a winning strategy. Everybody's exhausted. Your brains are all fried. They can't remember why house number six was better than house number 13 and why they didn't like number 19, because it's just too much. If I would have taken the time to maybe call some of my peers who were more experienced, ask some questions of them of, hey, how do I help these people narrow down? How do I help them focus and learn some good questions to ask? I think I would have had a lot more success early on. Yeah, that makes that that makes a lot of sense. You know, the it's t- I mean, some people he might, I mean, the, the guy used as an example, he must've just had good success on the phone before and getting to see, it's kind of like, if we could all see the future, uh, my, my team went to auction today. We go to auction, we target like hundreds of houses. We drive by all of them. We comp all of them. We come up with our max bid for all of them. And the reason we do that is we know that we're going to buy one at the end. We know we're going to buy some. There's a lot of times it gets to be discouraging for people because we went to, we attend four different auctions today, four different counties, four different areas. And three of them, we get skunked. And in one of them, we buy three houses. Right. But the, but if someone, um, if someone tells you that morning, like, Hey, do this. And no matter what tomorrow, you're going to buy an investment property. It's really easy to do it. You know, it, what's tough is picking up the phones and dialing, right? When people are like, okay, if you pick up the phone and you dial, you spend three or four hours a day dialing and learning the scripts in X amount of days, you will get a deal, but it's like believing in that promise and not giving up beforehand. And so the, but I think, you know, I think, I think your guy on that team over there was probably really good at outbound sales before, or he had experience with knowing the phone would at least, you know, every once in a while, you only need one person to make all those calls worth it. You know what he had? A, a an unwavering belief in that with no prior foundation of it. He was someone who, yeah, he had a very, um, he just really changed everything in his life. I don't want to share too much of his story without his permission, but he had, he had had some, some really personal struggles and, and some addictions and, and he overcame so much that I think he was just on this high of like, you know what? I believe in myself now. I didn't think I could overcome those things and look at what I've done. When he came to us, he didn't have, I mean, hardly a dollar in the bank. He he hadn't had a ton of success in his previous career, but he just had this unwavering belief of if someone else can do this, I can do this too. There's no reason that I can't. And he, I mean, he's living proof of it. He's impressive. 
Yeah. You know, the uh, day two of the mastermind, one of the favorite things that I heard was this gal from Klamath Falls, Oregon that had come down and she, we were kind of sharing, we we're spending our last 20 minutes kind of sharing our big takeaways. And she said, you know, why not me? Right. All these people are doing so many amazing things. I can do that too. Why not me? And so many of the things she said, I would have never imagined I could have goals like that or that I could do this volume or that I could do those things, but everybody's doing it and they're showing me how to do it. So like it was changing the mindset of that will never be me to why not me. And then the amount of effort that gets to go in that afterward. So the, so now you're getting listings, you're 70% listings. How do you get those listings? You do outbound prospecting and other than other than referrals, you know, the, or I, I, like a, or referral base or like from existing sphere, do you go get, you know, completely new people coming in? Do you do a bunch of outbound work for that, for that work? So obviously as you get, I, I kind of compare the early part of your real estate career to pushing a rock uphill. <laughs> it takes a lot of input before you get output. And then once you get to a certain point of momentum and not market knowledge and prior sales, that shifts to a downward slope and it's like a snowball rolling downhill. It just grows and grows and grows. And so I'm definitely at a point in my business where a a decent chunk of it comes from past clients or referrals from clients, but I am still very diligent at working the phones and really cold calling is one of my favorite methods of getting new business. Um, I know, I know everybody's looking for the, the secret sauce of like, Oh, just download this app and click your heels three times and you'll have seven listings. And, uh, you know, it's really just the diligence of, of picking up the phone and calling people and then having good scripts. Yeah. What are some of those scripts that you would share? So like, as you're, as you're making some of those calls and it's just, you're somebody's hearing from you for the first time ever, what's the sort of person that you're targeting and how do you start that conversation? So I love this question. This is something new agents ask me all the time because in this market, everyone's trying to get a new listing, right? And and sellers are inundated with these calls. It's like, you're the seventh agent I've talked to today. People are calling all the time. Yeah. And what most agents will do. So the, the essence of business is service. It's providing a service, providing value to the client, right? It's business at its core is not a self-centered endeavor, although it does benefit us. So when we, when we cold call someone, we have to bring something of value to them in order for them to want to work with us. The pitfall that most new agents fall into, and even seasoned agents, is they believe the value they're bringing is the value of your home. But see, the problem with that is everybody nowadays has a cell phone in their pocket, has a laptop, they know what Zillow is, they see their Zestimate or some other online estimate of their home value, even if it's way off, which most of us know it can be way off. Yeah. But they think they already know their home value. So you're not bringing them anything of significance to them that they don't already have a clue about. You know, it'd be, it'd be similar to me calling you about your car and saying, hey, the car markets went up. I know you paid 50,000, now it's worth 70,000. Do you want to sell? You'd be like, I don't know you. I, I've never talked to you in my life. Even I know my car is worth 70,000. No, I don't want to sell. I'll sell with my guy down the street that I bought it from because I have a connection with him. Yeah. So what I do instead is I will try to either bring my own buyer to the table. I'm very surgical with my cold calling. I, I pick things that I want to sell that I'm passionate about selling that I have a buyer for, or that someone that I know and trust in my real estate, whether it's in my team, my brokerage, someone in the market that I'm friends with, I will find a buyer, a real legitimate buyer for the product that I want to sell. And then I will start calling them. And I, my script is really, Hey, this is Caleb Spears with compass is Aaron available. I don't say, uh, is Aaron there? Is this Aaron? All of those things are kind of aggressive. They come off a little bit standoffish. I just say, is Aaron available? Hey, this is Aaron. Great. This is Caleb Spears with Compass. How are you today? I'm doing good. This is who? I mean, that happened. That's like nine out of 10 times. Who is this? Who Do I know you? Yeah. Hey, this is Caleb yeah. Spears with Compass. Listen, I have got a buyer and I will give them the specs of what I'm looking for. I've got a buyer looking in, in your neighborhood up to $6 million, up to a million dollars, whatever. Three bedrooms with a pool. I think your house would be perfect for them. I'm just calling some of the neighbors, seeing if they do want to sell. See, because now what I brought them is something they didn't have. 
They may have known the value of their house. They may have been thinking about selling, but they didn't have a buyer lined up for it or they would have already sold it. Yeah. Right. So I'm bringing them something of legitimate value. I'm now establishing myself as an expert in that market because I have the contacts looking for their specific property. And nine times out of 10, it's not, yes, oh my gosh, I want to sell. Tell me more. You do get those, which is, those are the best ones. A lot of times it's, hey, listen, we're not interested in selling, but thank you so much. And it's no problem. Look, me and my team, we do a lot of business in the area or I've grown up here, whatever your, whatever your value proposition is in that regard. We have a huge list of contacts. What else can I do for you? Do you guys need any work done at the house? Do you need a rental manager? Because our area is big on short-term rentals. Um, do you guys just need a good date night restaurant next time you're in town? I love to serve people. How can I help you? And that way you're building trust. You're bringing them a service-oriented mindset, which is the essence of business. And again, nine times out of 10, they'll say, look, we're good. We really appreciate that. A lot of them will then ask you about the market, ask you about conditions in the market. How do you feel it's trending? So make sure you have some stats on hand and, and some, some general market knowledge that you can share with them because that will then build your credibility and your trust even further. A lot of times those questions are to see if you're legit, are to see if you know what you're talking about because they've already been researching the market. And that's how a lot of folks will weed out newer agents as newer agents will pick up the phone so excited to call they won't know what they're talking about when they ask them questions on that neighborhood or that market. So go in with some prior market knowledge. The key is of the ones that do not want to do business right now, make sure you put them in some sort of follow-up system where you can continue to stay in touch because the, the agent that wins out 90% of the time is the last one that they talk to. There was a study done nationally and the study showed that people take on average about a year to decide that they're going to buy or sell a house. And during that time frame, they pick their agent in one day. And they spend a year thinking about this decision and they pick the agent that's going to handle it in one day. And it's almost always the last one that they talk to or the one they talk to the most. Hey guys, this is Aaron Muchistegi for another quick commercial break, but this is something a lot of you guys have been asking about. When we had our mastermind in May, we had a lot of people ask us about coaching, about how can we continue this process? Because so many of the people, so many of you guys out there listening to the podcast, you don't have resources where you are. You don't have other people nearby that can be mentors for you, that you can bounce ideas off of. And this business can be really, really lonely if you're not doing it with other people. So we have just now launched a great program for you and it's just Hyben Digital Coaching. It's it's Real Estate Rockstars Coaching. And here's what we do. We've got a we've got a spot you can go to. You go to realestateradio.fm forward slash coaching. We have individual one-on-one -on -one coaching where if you sign up, we match you up with a coach and we figure out like who's going to be the best coach for you for a couple calls a month. It's not that much money. It's I think it's going to be 950 bucks a couple calls a month with a coach that's been where you're going and they're gonna try to help you. And then we also have group coaching for a lot less where you can sign up and you can get in group coaching with groups of 10. And we can do calls every couple weeks uh, with different people that'll guide you through that process. So if you've been getting a lot from this mastermind, but you think you would get a little bit more for some one-on-one -on -one coaching from somebody who is has been exceeding in real estate, go to realestateradio.fm forward slash coaching realestateradio.fm forward slash coaching and sign up. We can't wait to find somebody to help you. Yeah. The, uh, the staying top of mind is so important with that follow-up because it's, it happens to me too. I, I know agents in all areas and I'm selling houses in all areas. And, and, but so many times if it's a, an area where I haven't listed something before, you know, it is quite often going like, who do I know up there that's listing it? And it's the most recent. I mean, I've even put on social media a few times like, hey, who do I know that's an agent in this in such and such town? Right. And then the first person to reply, I'm like, I've got a listing for you. Go sell it for me. And really, if I had had a conversation with somebody a week prior or two weeks prior that was in that town, I wouldn't have asked the question. That would have been my first go to call because that saves a step. Um, from that prospecting, you also, you kind of shared some of that script when, when we got to meet in May and I even thought that investors should be changing that for, you know, for their postcards, for their letters, for their phone calls, you know, people say, I want to buy your house. 
or we buy houses, right? It's a very common thing. It's a very common investor website. We buy houses type stuff. But when you can call them and say, I have a buyer for your house, I think it's trusted even more, even if you're the investor. And even if your buyer is the other part, when it's like, hey, I'm a third party and I'm trying to help them and I'm trying to help you, there, I think there's a lot, I think there's a way better chance that they're not thinking that somebody's trying to like out to get them at that point. Like, hey, I've got a, I have a buyer for your house. Someone interested in buying your house or interested in buying your property. Are you interested? So what do you think is going to happen with the market now? You know, what have you guys seen any changes over the last couple months? You're a, I mean, you have a lot of investors out there, a lot of secondary vacation markets. It's also paradise, right? So the, we have seen um, the market slow down a little bit out here recently. Uh, we've seen some price drops. It's still like less than a month of inventory, I'm sure, or less than two months of inventory. So it's not a bad market by any means. But for the first time in years, we're seeing price drops or houses stay on the market, you know, 30, 60, 90 days. I saw one that was listed last week for, or two weeks ago for 750. And then they kept dropping it. And today it's listed like 630 or 640. And then part of me is like, shame on you, agent, for doing it that way. Um, but it's also a really strange uh, process. So what, what are you seeing out there? Well, every, every market's going to be a little different. You know, I think for primary home markets where there's been a real exuberance in the market where people are thinking money's never going to stop flowing. There's been a lot of excess cash in the economic system from all the government interventions, stimulus checks, low interest rates, yep. people refining. There's been a lot of cash injected into the system. A lot of people feeling that rise were like, shoot, the getting's good is never going to end. Let me buy the maximum budget that I can afford on this house. Let me stretch a little bit to get our dream house because the money's good. The economy's good. Now that, that, now that we're starting to maybe crest over that hill, starting to go into a recession territory, we're kind of tiptoeing on that line. I think what we're going to see is a lot of folks who stretched and overextended for these properties are going to feel the squeeze of the economy, uh, the, the higher interest rates, the higher inflation rates. And um, these fixed salary employees are going to go, you know what? I think I just need to sell this thing and get out from under this mortgage and, and live a little more modest. There's going to be opportunity there. Um, I think for something like our market where we're vacation and a destination market, there's two schools of thought. One is nobody needs a second home. It's the first thing to go when the, when the going gets tough, which can be the case. But in our market, because the rental income is so good, uh, it's, it's one of the best rental markets in the nation. Airbnb actually ranked it as the best rental market in the nation recently in an, in an article. A lot of people can offset their costs in our scenario. And a lot of folks that we've been seeing have been cash buyers or they're putting a significant amount down. We've seen more people than ever before choosing not to rent their properties, even though they are second or third homes. So they're carrying these mortgages with no intention of offsetting them with rental income. I don't foresee them being very excited to sell their property at a loss. Mm -hmm. They'll just go, look, we'll wait this out. So I think the more affluent markets where people are are in that millionaire um, threshold where they can afford to carry properties and wait out a, a downturn in an economy, I think you'll probably see a modest correction as the balloon deflates a little bit. You'll see the overpriced properties start to drop their price or the odd fire sale that maybe now that sets a lower comp. So you, maybe you'll see a five or 10% correction in those markets. Um, but if people are still coming to destination markets, I think they remain strong. And then for the primary housing market, I think that's very dependent on the makeup of your population. And I do think we're going to see some squeezes and some, some more significant price changes over the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, when you have so much money in the market, for so long. And then all of a sudden that gets really tightened. We've talked about it a little bit too, um, you know, with just the mortgage industry, with, with just the number of, of kind of layoffs and reduction in income that a lot of industries have had, you know, the, a chart that I shared on my social media a week ago, I think it was showing, you know, that something like, uh, you know, I should pull it up to get it right. It's like a half of all income, you know, last year for mortgage income was refinances. And then knowing now, like that's just not going to happen as much. Yep. So the yes, yeah, so the the chart that I had that was the most 
impactful was, was that. So the, as it showed like the difference. So in 2021, more than half of the volume of, of work done for, for mortgage brokers or four, like something 4.2 trillion in, in mortgages that were done in 2021, 2.6 were refinances, right? So more than half were refinances in 2021. It's a really easy phone call. New mortgage brokers could call their buddy and say, I'm going to get you 50,000 bucks in a cash out refi and your new interest rates, two points less. So you're going to pay less also. I'm going to give you $50,000 and your payment's going down. They're like, cool, easy sale. You know, for the guy that's like learning how to cold call his friends, it's a really easy call. And in 2023, 2022, they think by the end of the year, it'll be uh, two and a half trillion in volume and only 0.8. It'll go from 2.6 trillion to 0.8 trillion in refinances. And then for 2023, they think it'll be under 0.5. So if 20, next year, they think refinances will make up only 15% of the mortgage industry. And last year it was 65% and the volume's gone way down. So what that means is there's just less, there's going to be less people working in that industry. And when you're talking trillions and the amount of money that's in that mortgage market for employees, it's a lot of jobs that change around. We're not going to have the, we don't have stimulus and things like that anymore. So I think the dollar, the dollar will change. Some of those markets, will, it has to affect somewhere. Somebody asked me today, they said, do you think the prices are going to go way down? And I said, and right now I, I don't think the prices are going to go way down. He said, They're waiting for a price drop. I said, I don't think, I said, I don't think prices are going to go up this year like they did last year. We're definitely not going to have a 25% increase again. And I say, definitely not. I've been wrong a bunch of times. And even last year, I was a little nervous about it, but the stats still said pretty good. Um, like I think prices will still maybe go up a little bit over the next 12 months, but I, and I don't think they're going to go down 10 or 15%, but I don't think we're going to see those huge increases anymore. Cause those huge increases are where somebody's like, Oh, the second home for 6 million bucks, let's offer a million bucks over asking. So we get the best one. Um, you know, you guys have seen some crazy, crazy listing prices out there. What's the one that I just saw you guys put on like 26 million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Which we have double ended right now. <laughs> so that's amazing, crazy. right? Yeah. You list a $26 million property and you, and you guys are bringing the buyer to for that. Well, Caleb, the, you know, one of the other reasons I wanted to come on to introduce you to everybody is the, when we got to meet at the mastermind last month, I was talking to you about, I've had different guest hosts coming on and helping essentially help pull the stories out of people. And, um, and I thought you would probably be a great guy to come on and be a guest host. So listeners out there, you're going to hear Caleb a little bit more over the next couple of months on some of the the guest hosting uh, that's been coming out with people. He's actually done his first couple. It'll get, it'll, uh, first couple of interviews, they'll get published after this one, but I wanted people to get to yeah, get to hear from you, get to hear your story. And I think you're just going to do such a great job uh, pulling the stories out of people. When it comes to that part of what's next, you know, the, what are you most excited about when it comes to being able to do some guest hosting on the podcast and doing some interviews? You know, what are you looking forward to with that? You know, I got to tell you, so number one, I love to help people. Like, I, I know that's cheesy. I know everybody says that, but when my brother first offered me the job in real estate, my response was, dude, real estate agents, they're like used car salesmen, right? Like they're always, they're just trying to make money and get a sale. I'm not about that. And he was like, you don't understand what I do. I help people with the largest financial transactions of their lifetime. I help people achieve their family goals, achieve uh, generational wealth that will bless generations of their family. Like these are very significant things I get to be involved with to help people. That was such a paradigm shift for me about real estate. It's what made me passionate about this industry. And what makes me so even more passionate than that is watching other people in this industry fulfill their potential, grow and hit that next level so that they can be doing those same things. So that's what I'm most excited about is just to bring value to your listeners and to try to, uh, like you said, pull the stories out of some of these top producers that maybe don't always slow down to share some of the secrets to success and some of that recipe. But really, I think what what your listeners are going to find is success leaves clues. And there's a, a commonality of threads that run through people's businesses, like cold calling, or just making sure you're talking to enough people, face to face interaction over automation and Uh, being knowledgeable about your market and about the product that you're serving, right? So all these things, I'm just excited to bring it to the listeners and and hopefully help some people change their businesses, change their lives and and grow. Yeah. 
Well, I think you're going to do that. I'm excited about, I'm excited to hear some of your interviews. I'm excited to have you be a part of that. And thank you for helping, you know, bless the listeners and, and bless me with being willing and able to step up in this kind of crazy time in my life and my journey. The, for people that want to reach out to you and ask you kind of some more about 30A or some more about the, the different stuff you've been building or, you know, some of those scripts and things like that, what's the best way people can reach out and find you other than so, coming and listening to you again, when you get to interview on the podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I always love when I go on podcasts and people DM me on Instagram, I try my best to respond to every single one of them. Um, so that's a great way to reach out to me. My Instagram is Caleb underscore Spears group, C-A-L-E-B underscore S-P-E-A-R-S group. And if you want to find me there and reach out, I'd be glad to help you um, with any questions you have. If you want to shoot me a call or a text, I'm happy to do that too. Uh, my cell is 850-974-1765. And whether it's helping you grow your business or helping a client in our market, I am, I'm happy to do both. So feel free to reach out. Awesome, man. Yeah, we've already done, we've done our, our, some chatting on social and chatting. Otherwise, Instagram is one of my favorite places to get to get to talk to people too. So Caleb, well, thank you so much for coming on today. It was great getting to chat with you again and get to focus on your real estate journey and real estate rock stars. Thanks for listening. All right, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I want to make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every penny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate, how to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. If you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our real estate rockstars page or at aaronamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.